doing history right now. Leave me alone. I'm doing history. Now, that was the lead up to Pearl Harbor. We're getting to Doolittle. Then Pearl Harbor happens. I don't have to explain to you what Pearl Harbor is. I'm not going to insult your intelligence. Uh, maybe I'll do a deep dive on Pearl Harbor, although I'm sure I've done one before at some point in time. Just know if you've ever been tempted to say, you know, well, that's suicide. Why'd they do that? They basically knew it was suicide. Japan felt that it had no choice. They felt it was their only chance. Hey, if we bomb their Pacific fleet, they'll be so hurt that it'll give us time to fortify these Pacific islands. And this is going to come into play here in a minute. America was mad, but there were a couple things going on. One, Japan was feeling pretty good about itself post Pearl Harbor, as you can imagine. And they were feeling like they had extended a defensive perimeter out far enough. And this is what I mean. It actually helps uh, if you're not driving. It helps when you talk about history things or when you hear someone else talk about them to look at a map. If you pull up a map, because I know you know what Japan looks like. I'm not saying you're stupid. It's just the Pacific is so vast and there's so much other crap down there. There's so much there. It's huge. That if you look at Japan, all right, you got Japan. Now zoom out from Japan. I'm doing it right now with you. You see all these different islands and nations, and then America's so far away. Remember, Pearl Harbor was not a one-off. Pearl Harbor was simply one aspect of a several-day offensive by Japan. They're taking Guam. They're taking Wake Island. They're taking the Philippines. They're taking all the... They're fortifying the islands around Japan. Make a little circle around Japan. Then make a bigger circle around that one. Then make a bigger circle around that one. They're trying to conquer bigger and bigger circles to fortify those islands from us coming. And Japan felt that they had enough of a circle. Now, I need to clarify a couple of things. These are going to they're gonna be details, but as the saying goes, that's where the devil is, isn't he, in the details? One, Japan did not have radar. You know of radar. You've seen Top Gun enough times to know, oh, no, Maverick's in the cockpit, and he looks down at this little thingy, and there's these other blinking thingies on the screen, and, now, oh, I know, I got a MiG, 20 knots, or whatever they say. You know what radar is. It's how you locate other planes and, and, and ships and things like that. We had it. The British had it. The Japanese did not. That's going to come into play here in a moment. So that, you need to take, you need to take that into effect. And two... This is a minor thing, but we didn't have an Air Force back then, all right? We had an Army Air Corps. The Air Force was part of the Army. The other part of America being angry was beyond the civilians, the leaders of America. While Japan was feeling good about itself and feeling comfortable, America, our leaders were feeling responsible to respond. Boy, is that a terrible way to put that. Responsible. They felt like they had a responsibility to respond. All right? So they did. They came up with an idea. Why don't we hit mainland Japan? I need to clarify, the Japanese were basically certain, while they were concerned, they were always very, very concerned about air raids on Japan, especially because everything's made out of paper and wood over there. They, they didn't think we had the capability. They'd done the numbers. They didn't think we had the capability, and they knew for sure we didn't have the capability to launch from Hawaii. Remember, all these launches, all these, uh, what, what are you capable of and not, it's all about fuel. Okay, we'll just make a bigger plane. Okay, you make a bigger plane, the bigger plane gobbles up more fuel. Okay, we'll make it lighter. Okay, I'll take the armor off. How do you think they're going to feel about, how do you think that plane is going to do with no armor? You see what I mean? The laws of physics haven't changed. Everything's about fuel. So someone comes up with the idea, let's take one of our bombers, one of our landing bombers. Remember, this wasn't really the aircraft era yet, the air carrier aircraft era yet. Let's take one of our land-based bombers and let's retrofit it a little bit and strip some of that armor off of it and see if we can get one that can take off off of an aircraft carrier. The challenge off an aircraft carrier, you know, it's not long enough. <laughs> They're not that long. It's not like land. The runway's a lot shorter. So they do this. And they come up with this crew. Uh, Doolittle's in charge of it. Should be noted, quick side note, he was also an oil executive. And it, every time I read about this story, that part hits me because it, I'm reminded of a better time in this country when our elites, when our leaders of society 
felt an obligation to our society. Not all this global citizen, climate change crap. Not all this, hey, we fly pride flags. They felt a genuine obligation to America and to freedom. And just, gosh, we had oil executives on suicide missions. Think about that. Anyway, anyway. Doolittle comes up with this plan, picks a bunch of air crews, and the plan is this. They take off from San Francisco, if I remember right. They head towards Hawaii, where Bull Halsey, Admiral Bull Halsey, Bull is his nickname, Bull Halsey, he's going to he's going to link up with them, and they're going to fly. Well, they're going to they're going to cruise along the ocean towards Japan until they have to fly. Their plan is to get within 400 miles of Japan, take off from the carrier. They weren't planning on ever coming back to the carrier. Bomb Tokyo and a few other cities. They all had their own targets. And then fly past Japan into China and try to land at a friendly air base in China. That was the Doolittle plan. It's a good plan. All right. Dangerous, but a good plan. Couple big hiccups happened. One, Japan controlled a lot of China too, especially a lot of the coastal towns. Like if you, again, you're looking at that map, Japan, you see China there. Japan, they had been taking over coastal cities and coastal areas in China to kind of kind of meld those two worlds together. That's one. And two, Japan wasn't totally naive to the fact somebody might try to attack so they had boats out. They had ships out, ships that had radios on them, patrolling back and forth, seeing what you can find. Remember, this is prior to them putting satellites in the sky. So Japan, they, they had boats out, and one of them spotted our guys, but we were too far away from the Japanese mainland. We were too far away. How far away were they? I don't know. I, apparently, it's lost to history, but we do know it was too far away. They run into a Japanese ship. The Japanese ship, they believe, radioed back to Japan, so they quickly sink the ship, and now you've got a decision to make. Do we go forward with the raid, or do we don't? To their credit, they decide we're going to launch the raid. Now, keep in mind, we have a fuel problem here. They were already going to be pressed for fuel to get clear to that Chinese base after they bombed Japan. Now, they're taking off a lot further away. We launched the raid. These aircraft, they take off from the ship successfully. To his credit, Doolittle went first and almost took his right into the ocean. <laughs> but he took off successfully. I forget the exact number of bombs, but it wasn't many. I think they had three 500-pound bombs on them apiece and one incendiary bomb, something like that. It wasn't a lot, right? It was a lot. And they took off and they had specific targets. Now, remember when I said they were too far away? So they get close to Tokyo, and they were supposed to originally attack at night. It was to provide them with more cover, attacking at night. Because they had to take off early, it screwed up the whole timeline, and they ended up having to attack during the day. You have probably read stories about people in Hawaii not understanding what the heck is happening when they were attacked Pearl Harbor and there were Americans who waved at Japanese pilots and the Japanese pilots waved back during Pearl Harbor. Guess what? Same thing happened in Tokyo. They're looking up in Tokyo. They don't know American planes. The Japanese were doing drills all the time. The Japanese people, school children, were waving to our guys right there in Tokyo. Hey! Oh, whoa, what's that dropping, mommy? You know, that kind of a thing. So our guys drop stuff. They don't do a lot of damage. Again, contrary to what you see in the movies, it's very, very inaccurate to bomb something from a plane. The winds and everything else, I don't care how many little little things you put on there. Unless you have something that's guided, it's very difficult to hit something. That's why we carpet bomb. Well, I can't hit something, so I'll hit everything. That kind of thing. We miss. Well, that's not fair. We hit a few targets, nothing significant. We were actually told, I don't know if you know this, to avoid schools and to avoid the emperor's palace. So we didn't want to take it too far. We were told to avoid the emperor's palace. Eh, don't ask me. Anyway, we push on, but now our ships are running out of fuel, and they're running out of fuel fast. They can't get to the Chinese airbase. They have to start crash landing on purpose on the Chinese coast. Now, you, you may know all that. Um, what you probably don't know is this part of it, and then we'll get to your phone calls and everything else. The Japanese were mortified that we were able to hit them 
They were mortified that anyone was that close to the emperor. Remember, they considered him a god at this point in time. And they were really mortified that they did not properly plan for the Chinese to work with us, which they very clearly did because they knew the planes had gone down over there. The Japanese had enough intelligence resources and control of the area. They knew not only had our planes gone down over there, clearly somebody was helping our pilots, which they did. I want to credit them. There were all kinds of missionaries in China at the time, all kinds of anti-Japanese guerrillas in China at the time. And our guys had been trained. This is after Nanking, by the way, Chris. This is after Nanking. And actually, that's going to come into play here in a minute. This is after the Chinese had invaded Nanking and whatnot. So we knew the horror Jap the Japanese would do. Our guys had been trained in the language and customs to extend a hand to the Chinese and basically ask for help. Hey, I need help. I need you to get me to this air base. I need you to get me somewhere. And our guys, sometimes they crashed into the mountains, sometimes in the swamps. Sometimes it just, it was ugly. But most of our guys got out of there. But you should know that a few of our guys did get captured. They beheaded three of them. They had a show trial, made a big show of beheading three of them. One of them, they let rot in prison, which honestly, the guys who got beheaded were the lucky ones. The guy who died in prison took a long time to die, and it was very unpleasant. But for the most part, again, credit to the Chinese, they're the guerrillas and the missionaries there. Our guys did get rounded up and got out. Doolittle himself got out. But the bad part came. The Japanese were not gentle before they thought their emperor had almost been bombed. The Japanese decided to launch a massive reprisal that's really not known very much in America for the Doolittle Raid. They began to basically rape and pillage like a medieval army, like the Mongols on the move. Cities of 50,000 people, they would go in kill every man, rape every woman and child, and burn the city to ash. They actually had specialist incendiary groups to make sure they burned everything. They tore up the rail lines. They had a special unit. You've probably heard of them before, Unit 731. They specialized in basically different forms of torture and biological warfare and things like that. Well, 731 had been developing ways to deploy deadly diseases, diseases like cholera, on top of killing all the men and women and children in this area. And when I say all, I'm talking, we don't know the numbers. They think it's 250,000 Chinese, most of them innocent civilians. Cities burned down, living in horror like you can't believe. At the end, Unit 731 came in and distributed things to the troops. They started poisoning wells and rivers and so many Chinese were already dying because the hospitals had been burned down and all the doctors and nurses got murdered that more people got sick and died. It was the wake of the Doolittle Raid, which no American seems to know about, was one of the worst human rights violations in the history of the world. That is the Doolittle Raid. And it's still a point of controversy to this day if you read about it. We did not tell the Japanese or the Chinese nationalist leader that we were going to do the raid because we didn't want word to get out and we knew that he'd know reprisals would come his way so we actually kept it secret from the Chinese. That is the story of the Doolittle Raid. <laughs>